Hello AP Calculus AP students, Mr. Record here from Avon High School and we would really like to welcome you to our first video for topic 3.3 and as you can see from the screen 3.3 is all about finding the derivative of an inverse function and I have a rather unique way of approaching this idea and I would like to gradually lead you into the way that is the most common way that students would be asked to do this on the advanced placement calculus exam. And while we approach that method, uh, we'll have a chance to kind of review what the basic nature of an inverse function is and refresh our algebra skills along the way. So hey, why don't we get started here? So from my notes, my curriculum that I've written at Avon High School, I begin with this method one, as you can see. And it, note, it, it has some special notation here. It says that this method works when it's really easy to generate the inverse function. And, and by generating the inverse function, I mean doing the swap for x and y and solving for the new y. Taking the inverse is really accomplished once you swap the x and y. But sometimes we like to solve for that new y to have that inverse written in this really nice form. But a lot of times on the AP exam, that's not possible um, and very likely it will never be possible on the AP exam. So we have this uh, method one that might be a little obsolete here as far as advanced placement, but it's going to really set the tone for some of the other methods that will work. So what I want to do is kind of jump down to the example and just kind of talk about it for a moment. It says if f of x is x squared, where x is greater than or equal to zero, we want to find the derivative of the inverse of f at x equal four. Before we dive into this particular problem, I would like to take a look at this question in a little bit different environment. So I'm going to bring in my graphing calculator and have you watch through this little exercise. So here we are working with the TI Inspire calculator. And I wanted to make it very clear that the activity that I'm about to show could work really on a variety of different calculators. Um, it can also work with Desmos. So don't think too much about the technology that's being used here. If you're watching this video from outside of Avon, just think about the actual mathematics that I'm trying to have uh, you kind of rem remember from say your college algebra, pre-calculus algebra two class and uh, kind of think of it that way. So what I'm going to do, um, if you are familiar with the TI Inspire, is I'm going to actually work within a document. It's very important for this particular activity because of a special feature that I'm going to use. And so the very first thing that I'm going to do um, is to graph our good friend, uh, the function y equal x squared. So I'm going to add a graphing page and we're going to throw our graph of y equal x squared in there and boom there we see him in all of his wonderful parabolic glory and then I'm going to ask hey I would really be interested in finding what is the inverse of this function so we think about that for a little bit and I've already gave away a, a really important aspect of the inverse of any function in mathematics and that is the whole fact that the x and the y get flip-flopped we we basically trade the domain for the range and so we could graph x equal y squared now the ti inspire will do that in a very clever way if we go into the menu option and choose our graph entry i don't want to use a function because x equal y squared could give us a little bit of problems when we try to enter that because we don't have a y by itself so we'll go into this idea of relation and in the relation uh, bar here i can actually physically type in x equal y squared and then i'm going to have this graph now because this is the first relation that i've graphed the color scheme cycles through from the beginning again which starts with blue so I'm going to go in and just cosmetically I'd like to change this color I can do that by hitting a control menu choose option B color option one line color and let's make this nice and red so it stands out so I'm gonna move some things around and just take a look at this now I keep using this idea of inverse function right it's very important those two words together is this graph an inverse function? And hopefully you'll look at this and you'll say, well, wait a minute, time out. That's not good. This is not a function, right? As you can see, this thing fails the vertical line test just terribly. 
And that's true. And the reason that it fails this vertical line test is because the graph from which it came fails the horizontal line test. And maybe that's an idea from your algebra days that you remember now. Failing the horizontal line test means that you're failing to be called one to one. And that's what's a, a very important for an original function to adhere to in order for its inverse to exist. The original function must be one to one, which means it will pass the horizontal line test. Basically, one to one says we don't want two different x's to have the same y value. And we can see that that's a problem here. But if you remember the question that was in our notes packet, began with y equal x squared when x was greater than or equal to zero. And you notice that if you were to take this function and rework it and say, well, wait a minute, I only want the x values to be greater than or equal to zero, we're going to achieve that one-to-one -one idea and thus be okay. And that's exactly why a lot of those trig functions that you learned about in your trig class only had inverses when their domains were very specifically defined. Like for example, the sine of x only has a domain or only has a, an inverse when we define the, the sine function from negative pi over two to positive pi over two. So very easy fix. All I'm going to do is call up this y equal x squared, which I can just click on the graph to do that, hopefully. And then I can say, hey, let's throw in a such that control equal, it's that little vertical bar there. And then I can say x is going to be strictly greater than or equal to zero. And then if I resketch it by hitting enter, now I have a really nice behaved one-to-one -one function that's probably going to have an inverse. Now, there's ways that you can link these two uh, uh, equations together, the x squared and the y squared inverse, so that this would have been really dynamic and really cool, and you guys could have seen the changes that would be made to the red graph. But I would rather do this manually because I want to emphasize something. So I'm going to double click on this x equal y squared relation, and I'm going to ask you a question. I want you to all think about this. If the x is greater than or equal to zero in the original blue function, what must be true about this particular red curve? And hopefully you're all thinking what I'm thinking. That is, the y must be greater than or equal to zero. And so I can again put that such that in there. Control equal will bring my greater than or equal to button uh, menu option down. And now if I sketch that graph, we see a little bit more interesting relationship here in that we truly have an inverse function uh, graphed by this red curve. I'm going to move this over a little bit so that we can kind of see it uh, uh, a little bit more easily perhaps here move these out of the way. And just for kicks, I want to remind you something else about inverse uh, functions and, and their graphs. They have this really interesting relationship with one another, the f and the f inverse. They have this symmetry idea, if you recall, this mirror image around a very particular line. And maybe you remember that that line is the line y equal x. So what I'm going to do is graph y equal x by going into my menu, graph entry, function, and I'll just type in f2 of x equal x. That's the same as y equal x. Now when that graphs, it's probably not the color I want because it's the second function that I've graphed, which means it's going to use the second color option through the cycle, which is red, but no harm. I'm going to go ahead and... Uh, hover over it, I can either right click with my mouse or control menu if I'm actually using the handheld, and I can change that color. And let's change that color to, let's say, green. And then I can even make that line a little less uh, provocative, let's say, by going into its attributes. And I can change the attributes to be, oh, how about dashed or even dotted? We'll go with dashed there. And so, now you can really see that relationship between these two graphs, that they truly are symmetric with respect to that line y equal x. All right, let's go ahead 
return back to our document and work through example one, but I'm not going to leave this guy alone right now. I want to go ahead and, and keep this up on the screen uh, because I want to return to this and use some of the knowledge that we've gained from solving a problem one and so tie some things together. And here we are back again at the document. And we remember we had the function f of x equaling x squared, and we're asked to find its inverse at x equal 4. Perhaps you recall this is the notation that we like to use for inverse. So the very first thing that I'm going to do is just going to go through this checklist. And option A here says, let's find the inverse function by interchanging x and y and solving for the y, as it says. So that won't be too hard. We know that this f of x is behaving like a, a y for right now, so we'll switch it to an x, and we'll call that x squared a y squared for right now. And then we realize, well, that was the relation that I sketched on the calculator a moment ago. But this problem wants us to go a little bit farther with this and actually solve this for y. So what I'm going to do is take the square root of both sides. And as I do that, we have to make some kind of an interesting consideration here. Now, normally, you know, the square root of y squared we know is y, as long as y is behaving in a certain way, let's say, and that the square root of x can just be left as the square root of x. Now, I'd like to swap these, if that's OK, and make it look like this. But remember, as I said before, the square root of y squared, by definition, is not really y. It's, it's really plus or minus y, depending on what y sign was to begin with. Or we could even say the absolute value of y. But all of that can be completely ignored in this question. And the reason is because if x has to be greater than or equal to 0 to the original function, that means our y has to be greater than or equal to 0 in its inverse. And therefore, there's no need to put the plus nor the minus here. We know that we just want the positive because y is meant to be positive. So we can do away with that plus minus, which is nice. And then the only other thing that I'd say that we could do here is we could give this guy a different name. Y doesn't want to just be called Y anymore. He's kind of special. He says, hey, you know, give me some credit. I'm an inverse now. Call me something that's a little bit more, let's say, uh, sophisticated. So we're going to go ahead and call him F inverse of X. And so we've done essentially everything that step A has asked us to do. Now, if we go to step B, step B says, take the derivative of this new Y. And this will be the derivative of the inverse function, which is part of the problem's directive. Now, I want to suggest a little bit of a new notation that maybe you haven't seen before. What does it look like when you take the derivative of an inverse from a notation standpoint? Well, certainly you can put the d over dx notation. There's nothing wrong with that if you want to use uh, the ideas that Leibniz left behind. Or if you want to use the prime notation, sometimes that's credited to Newton, but it's really called Lagrange notation, you could do that as well. Now, if we want to use prime notation, what we have to do is set this up so that we put the f inverse in parentheses and the prime mark around him like such. Now, I know that seems kind of weird. It's like, why the extra parentheses? Well, honestly, the reason for it is because this looks pretty ridiculous, right? To have that prime and that negative 1 superscript so close together without a parenthesis divider. It's just notation. So that's the way that we want to think about this. So if we take the derivative of x to the 1 half power, which is really what the square root of x is, we can bring the 1 half in front, multiply by x, decrease the power by 1, and lo and behold, we have 1 half x to the negative half, which we could simplify and rewrite if we wanted to as 1 over the 2 square root of x. Now, finally, we can move on to part C. It says plug in your given k value, which is some value. And I apologize. I do know how to spell. We'll fix this here. V-A-L-U-E. <laughs> so we're going to find that particular k value. And what we're going to think of is this k value is just it's some x that's been given to you in the problem. So that x is equal to 4. So basically, from a notation standpoint, they're just saying to take that inverse's derivative and replace that x with 4. And so as we do that in this particular problem, we have 1 over 2 times the square root of 4, which 
would be 1 over 4. And that would be our final answer. We've completed everything that the question's been uh, asking us to do. Now, I, I want to do one tiny quick thing to end this video. I know this video has kind of gone a little long, but it's, it's it has a lot of supporting idea with algebra that I wanted you guys to be exposed to. But what I wanted to do is just ask you a very quick question and just have you think about this. Think about what is the derivative at that particular function, of that particular function, at a point that's sort of the sister point to when the x value is 4. Now, what do I mean by the sister point? What's that all about? If x is 4, well, what, what, what is he referring to? Well, if we think about our function inverse, this guy right here, there's no denying that if we were to take the 4 and plug it in for x, we're certainly going to get 2. And so what that means is that the ordered pair 4 comma 2 happens to be the point on our inverse, the one that we just found the derivative for. The sister point would be the reverse, right? 2 comma 4, that would really be a part of this curve. And you can probably see that if you let x be 2, there's no arguing the fact that f of x is going to be 4. I want us to look at the relationship between those two slopes. Let's take a look. All right, so here we go. First thing that I want to do is I want to actually look at that tangent line that we just computed the slope for, for the inverse curve. Remember, that's the red curve. So to do that, with the TI Inspire, since I'm in a document setting, I can go into the menu option, choose geometry, points and lines, and I can choose this very cool option here called tangent. And when I do that, it just simply allows me to choose a curve. I'm going to go with the red curve here. And then boom, before you know it, this wonderful line that's tangent to the curve anywhere that we want it to be appears. And so now I can just kind of let this guy move until I get to when x is, say, uh, 4, which looks right about right there. And I've got my tangent line. Now I'm going to hit escape to get out of this tangent line mode just so that I can maybe grab the endpoints of this line and maybe extend it so it really looks like a long line. And I just ask you all to take a peek at this and notice what its slope is, 0.25, and connect that to the answer that we just computed, which was 1 fourth, and say, hey, that is true. We also know that the y-intercept is 1, for whatever that's worth. Now what I want to do is the same thing to the original curve, the blue curve, at the sister point. So I will go into my menu options, choose geometry, choose points and lines, and go with the tangent again. This time let's choose that blue curve, and there's the line. We can move it around, but this time I want the x value to be 2, which looks like it's going to be right around in this vicinity, and let's see if we can get it where we want it to be. Uh, ever so slightly. Sometimes it's tough, guys. Sometimes it's so tough to do. Mm, oh, I wish I could get it right there because it would be so cool. Boom, I got it. <laughs> it's, the mouse is a little sensitive. So I'm going to hit escape so I can do the same thing. Let's just extend these uh, arrows so that we can make this look more of like a, a longer tangent line. And then I want you all to take a look First of all, make sure I put it at the right spot, 2 comma 4, which I did, and take a look at that slope, 4. What is the relationship between the two slopes of these lines? 0.25 and 4, or maybe it's better to think of this as 1 fourth and 4, and boom, yes, they are reciprocals of each other, and that idea is so important. It helps you really get a good understanding about what the relationship is between the tangent lines of a function and its inverse, but it also sets the stage for some very important information that you're going to see later. Anyway, I hope this video kind of helps a little bit introducing you to the idea of inverse and retracing some steps from some old algebra ideas at the same time. Please stick around because we have several other great videos in store for you for the derivative of the inverse. Thanks for joining.